Hello and welcome to Fit for Hatcheries webinar. My name is Lucia Barreiro and I am the editor of Hatchery Feed and Management. This is the second webinar on Feeds for Hatcheries that is part of the series Trends in Aquaculture Hatcheries that we are hosting focused on different topics of importance for hatcheries. Improving the quality of larvae and juveniles is one of the main objectives of hatcheries and feed is a key factor to achieve this. Recent advances in feed nutrition, production and management have improved larval performance and some of these innovations will be discussed today. Thanks to the support of our sponsors, Biomar, Cargill, Seafeed, Inve Aquaculture, Reed Mariculture and Wilford Aquaculture, this webinar is open and free. Each speaker will give a 15 minute presentation and then we will get to a final panel session to answer questions from the audience. To submit a question, please type it in the Q&A box and our webinars in this series will be available on our website and on YouTube. Especially thanks to our assistant editor and webinar manager, Marisa Yanaga, who's making sure all our webinars work. And finally, it's my pleasure to introduce Peter Roussier, who will be moderating this webinar. Peter is director of the Laboratory of Aquaculture and Artemia Reference Center at the University of Ghent. He's an internationally recognized expert in the aquaculture research fields of microbial community management, host microbe interactions and genetics with a special focus on larvae culture. Peter has previously been involved in research projects on the application of bioflock technology in aquaculture systems. He has managed a large number of research projects, including the FP7 funded project ProMicro. Peter, hand it over to you. Good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Uh, it's a pleasure of me to be here present today. And today we have for you four speakers. And I can introduce to you the first speaker, that's Jan Hibigerstein. Yes, Jan was involved in several research projects, such as the first reading of bluefin tuna fingerlings in Malta, but also in larval feeding tests in Balan Ras, and the development of macro diets for marine fish larvae. Jan is now managing biologist of seafood, uh, looking at improving early stages of larval feeding and larval rearing of multiple species by optimizing the live feed solutions. And today his seminar is on copper pots and how that can be a superior live feed. Jan, the floor is yours. Yeah, hi, thanks a, lo uh, thanks a lot for the nice introduction, Peter, and also thanks a lot uh, to Lucia and Marisa, uh, Marisa for, and also the whole uh, hatchery feed uh, and management team for providing this great webinars and um, yeah, basically giving us uh, the floor to talk about our passion. So um, yeah, my name is Jan Giebichenstein. Um, I'm working for Seafeed uh, as uh, copperpot producing company based in Norway. And, uh, that, and that's also my topic for today. Um, copperpots as a superior live feed in your hatchery production. So let's directly hop into the, uh, into the topic. Um, in, uh, with, uh, with humans, everyone knows that basically what you're feeding your kids will is basically the base for uh, for their whole life, and that is uh, very similar for uh, for fish larvae uh, as well. Um, beside of the fact that especially marine fish larvae are very small and uh, requiring live feed for the uh, for the first couple of days. Um, Conventional live feeds such as rotifers and artemia um, are often insufficient in nutrition and also can cause uh, biological uh, problems um, that results in, uh, in high mortality rates and uh, deformities uh, also showing uh, lower growth rates and can also uh, 
also be a factor of stress for the fish larvae. So we from Seafeed uh, think that there's quite some room to improve uh, with benefit for the whole industry. So, and to improve this, uh, this particular, uh, particular early larvae rearing, uh, the solution for us is it's called copper pots as the natural start, uh, the natural live feed uh, marine fish larvae are feeding on. So by being the natural feed, um, the nutritional value of copper pots for fish larvae is excellent. So uh, we, we are talking rich in DHA, EPA, and uh, also taurine. And the, the copper pots, and that's also a very important point, are very easy to digest for the fish larvae. So there's no enrichment ne necessary. And another positive effect or a, a positive feature is basically the moving behavior. So copper pots are basically jumping what is triggering a feeding uh, yeah, a feeding reflex from uh, the larvae. So we managed to we managed to produce uh, copper pots in a pathogen and biosecure way, and that's what you can see here. So we are managing a, sea, uh, a copper pot farm uh, close to Trondheim, uh, Trondheim, Norway. And uh, there we are, first of all, producing, uh, producing microalgae, um, feeding, uh, feeding our bootstock. And we have several bootstocks. This uh, bootstock is producing, um, producing eggs. We are, we are harvesting these eggs, uh, processing them. Uh, packing and storing them and making these eggs available as a product for aquaculture. So um, these eggs we are distributing to basically worldwide. Uh, we have customers in Japan, uh, in Korea. Uh, we are delivering to the US and uh, South America. Uh, but basically, we are we are based in Europe, so uh, most of our customers are all around Europe and especially Norway. So um, the copper pots, the copper pot X needs to be uh, stored cold, and they are also transported cold. So we are placing the the bottles uh, on ice and uh, shipping to our customers. Express at uh, our customers, you can uh, you can keep these bottles in the fridge for a couple of weeks. So now at your side you have the copper pot X. So what to do with it? And uh, the question is easy to answer: just uh, hatch them, and that's a really easy process, very similar to Artemia hatching. You can, uh, you're, you're using uh, the same tank design, so conical tanks, uh, strong aeration. So the only difference here is uh, that we are requiring to block uh, the outlet. You can do it with a block and uh, a string uh, attached to a string so that you can remove it after the hatching. And the point here is that copper pot eggs are quite small with uh, 65 micron. And they are also for that size quite heavy. So uh, they are uh, heavily sinking to the bottom. That's also why we need quite strong aeration to keep, keep them suspended in, in the water column. And uh, the basically the outlet is an area where, uh, where um, copper pot eggs can sediment and that would reduce your uh, hatching success. So we are recommending uh, using two, uh, two temperatures. Uh, tw you can hatch them at 26 degrees. Uh, then after 24 hours, 
you will have the hatched, hatched copper pot now ready to feed to your fish larvae, or you can use 21 degrees for the hatching uh, process. And then after 48 hours, you have uh, your, your nautily ready to be fed. Um, we are recommending in the hatching tanks uh, stocking density of around 500 uh, individuums per milliliter. So now you have the copper pots uh, in your, your tank. Um, and so how to feed them. So the copper pot now please have a size of around 100 micron, a bit, uh, bit bigger. So they are perfectly to replace rotifers. And on the left side of the slide, you see a pretty standard uh, feeding regime using algae for green water first, um, later on uh, followed by artemia and, uh, and weaning them onto dry, dry feed first uh, at, at the end. So um, the most probably best option is a complete rotifer replacement by copper pots. You are also getting, by doing that, completely rid of your uh, rotifer cultures. So you have an easy solution, just taking out a, a bottle um, out of the fridge and hatching the copper pot eggs and uh, yeah, uh, and quite reducing your work effort. A different feeding opportunity is a supplementary feed of uh, copper pots, meaning uh, feeding copper pots for a short period of time that can be at the very beginning of, uh, of your larval feeding or in periods where you have, uh, have, uh, have problems, for example, the swim blood inflation or, or high, high mortalities. So the last, and we like to call uh, the, uh, the last option, we like to call it uh, the vitamin pill option is you're leaving your rotifer feeding regime untouched um, and just adding basically copper pots as a small meal once a day um, to just improve your uh, nutritional quality of the feed. So we are coming along with customized feeding, uh, feeding solutions for, ro ro for copper pots. And uh, these uh, customized solutions are based on, of course, uh, on the system you're operating, on the larval stocking density, but also very dependent on the species. Talking about species, we are working on multiple species, um, improving production of fish and shrimp larvae, uh, increasing profitability, and basically producing better quality, quality larvae. So uh, one species is, for example, the tiger grouper in Asia, bluefin tuna in Japan, Korea and Europe, uh, Balamres mainly in Europe and Scotland, sea bream all around the Mediterranean, Atlantic cod also, uh, also in Norway, and one of my favorite ones, uh, Seriola, um, basically all around the world. So um, for this presentation and also to, to save, save some time here, I'm, um, I have quite generalized the positive effects of, uh, of copper pots. And we have basically data available for close to every species uh, that is reared in aquaculture. Um, in this presentation, I will only show very general uh, data, but please, uh, if you want to have more, more details on your uh, species you're working with, then please uh, contact me under uh, jan at cfeed.no, and I'm very happy to provide you with more details and uh, 
also discuss how best to optimize your, your feeding regimes. So as a general, uh, gen general improvement, survival and growth is very important. So with all species we are working, we have seen an increase in survival and also a better larval growth. So I already touched shortly on it, uh, the swim bladder inflation by using, uh, by, by the fact that the copper pots are not, uh, you don't need enrich, uh, to enrich them. Um, these, uh, the copper pots can also not lose the enrichment into the larval tank. So that results in a much cleaner uh, larval culture uh, in a much cleaner surface. What is good for the larvae to, to inflate the swim bladder to gulp air, but also uh, very good for the operator, uh, for, for the hatchery by uh, putting much less work in skimming effort. So another positive effect is a more equal growth. Uh, we, uh, we have, uh, we have see, uh, seen uh, that is reducing cannibalism. For example, up on the right side, you see a sea bass larvae um, having, having one, uh, one other larvae already in its stomach and it went for, for a second one, having that one in its mouth already. Uh, the picture below is showing bluefin tuna, I think around 15 days and also there, you see a quite huge, uh, huge size difference that will basically uh, causing problems at a later stage. So by having more equal growth, you are um, you are having uh, having to sort and grade less, and by that also reducing stress for your larvae. Another very important factor in larval aquaculture is deformities, and also there, we we uh, the copper pots are reducing uh, the amount of, of deformities in, uh, occurring, um, improving the general larval quality, also reducing handling stress uh, when when sorting uh, sorting the fish at the later stage. Whoop. Um. My last point, uh, and that is also uh, one of the most important po uh, points here, with, uh, with feeding copper pots, we have seen um, a better early gut development. And this early gut uh, better early gut development is, uh, is also having uh, very good long-term effects. So we are seeing on the one hand, of course, a better growth, but also that the food you are giving uh, to the larvae is converted better. So we are seeing a reduced FCR and that not only in the larva phase, but also in the whole ongoing growing phase of, of your fish. And that's also a, a point where you can really uh, save money by feeding less and getting more fish out. This, this fact has been uh, published for, for Gados Muhua, uh, that's Atlantic cod, um, but we are also seeing that for other species. So to sum up, once the key value proposition for, uh, for using copper pots is a high quality a uh, live feed uh, that is ready to use immediately um, and biosecure um, and that is increasing the profitability of your hatchery. So here are some numbers on the, uh, on the uh, re results I have just, uh, just show you just to give you an overview and I'm very happy to discuss this in more detail uh, when, when you're contacting me. Um, that's basically from, from my side. Um, so I'm very happy to uh, discuss in our Q&A session at the end 
of all the uh, tours, uh, the talks. And now I'm very excited to hear what Neil, Iman, and Yo uh, will will talk about. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Jean. So as agreed upon in the beginning, uh, we will keep questions uh, until the end. So the idea is to proceed first with the other three presentations. I have seen already something like 14 questions for you. There are some interesting ones. Uh, probably can have a look as well in the meanwhile. Uh, and we can discuss them later. So our next speaker for today. So Jan, you have already nicely unshared your screen. Excellent. So that allows Neil to go uh, to do the share on his screen. In the meanwhile, I can uh, introduce Neil to you, Neil Gervais. Uh, Neil has extensive commercial experience in large and commercial scale shrimp hatchery design, construction and operations, shrimp domestication programs, larval nutrition and disease control. So he's currently managing partner of Wilford Aquaculture, a US processor of high quality artemia cyst and provider of unique larval feeds, probiotic and prebiotic symbiotic solutions for larval disease and water quality management. So that's also what this Neil is going to talk about today. It's his uh, presentation is about comparison of feed versus water applications for symbiotic solutions dealing with EMS in aquaculture. Neil, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank everybody here and for hatchery uh, manage, feed management for giving us this opportunity to do these presentations. Um, yeah, today I am going to discuss, let me get a shared screen. Okay. Not as smooth as this, y'all have to excuse me. I'm not as practiced as a lot of the Yes, people. you're fine. Okay, very good. Um, so you see the screen okay now? the presentation yes we do okay wonderful um again little little rusty here um i'm uh, going to discuss with you all today uh, some trials that we just ran in a commercial hatchery uh down in ecuador where uh, we're comparing the effects of replacing uh the hatchery's normal uh, probiotic regime, which is uh, fermenting uh, for several days in the facility itself, several strains of, of commercially available probiotics um, with probiotics applied uh, with the vacuum coder to feeds there at the, the point of, of fabrication. Um, that the reason that I'm doing this presentation um, is sure as most hatchery uh, biologists and technicians here know that uh, Vibrio dominates uh, a lot of our management decisions and our success or failure at the hatchery level. Um, in Ecuador specifically, um, we've had some tremendous uh, problems with EMS. Um, the same as a lot of places in the world, but it's been, it was uh, devastating uh, to the hatchery industry over the last several years. And hatcheries have found ways to um, dominate uh, uh, and dominate the Vibrio, uh, the causing EMS in the tanks. Uh, and there's several different approaches that they've had to do that. Um, that uh, biosecurity measures that were almost non-existent are currently in place, um, that water disinfection facility dryouts, the use of brood stock coming from the farm um, and how they're coming in, the nopli source uh, are always taken into consideration. Um, that once the animals are in the system and the larvae or the larval system is operating, then therapeutics are normally used. Antibiotic treatments have pretty much been eliminated because they're just not effective. Um, chemical antimicrobial treatments, probiotic, uh, bacterial strains, 
uh, carbon sources in prebiotic form, um, feed additives, organic treatments, and immune stimulants are commonly added or used uh, in the day-to-day -day tank cultures and trying to control Vibrio. Um, and tank water management is also part of the approach. Uh, water exchanges, tank transfers, where the animals are harvested mid-cycle and transferred to other tanks. Um, temperature uh, modification and changes in salinity. Um, the um, diseases that we're typically, typically seeing from Vibrio um, besides EMS is not the first one for the last, well, since there's been culture there, they've had a series of, of epidemics uh, that have affected the, uh, uh, that have affected hatcheries. Uh, one of the first ones was bolitas, uh, the sloughing of the gut lining uh, forming spheres. This was uh, caused by, by uh, bi different vibrio species uh, in early stages in the hatchery. Um, and this is where we first really had to learn how to control um, pathogenic vibrio and recognize the importance uh, and the effects they were gonna have on us. Luminescence, um, necrosis, those are the typical things that we used to see, but the management and, and uh, very little bacterial management, just hatchery techniques, we were able to control those. Uh, EMS came in and it, it changed everything, that uh, it was a disease that came in and it would take out entire tanks uh, in, a matter of, in a matter of hours. We would lose entire facilities, uh, large animals, and uh, some different techniques had to be developed and practices modified. Um, it's, let's see. Um, it hit Ecuador harder than a lot of other countries reported in the hatchery, not so much at the farms that the selection programs in Ecuador uh, were designed around bringing animals that had survived uh, at the farms and gave the best performance, bringing them back to the hatchery, um, bringing them through uh, the, the entire cycle and going back to the farm, uh, always exposing the animals to the pathogens that were there. Um, every generation, the animals became somewhat more tolerant to the ambient diseases that were, uh, that were present. Uh, when EMS came in, the animals that we had in the farms already showed a pretty high tolerance, but those animals when they were brought back into the hatcheries introduced EMS into all the facilities. And um, we had a, a new problem. Larvae had no tolerance to it whatsoever. That uh, within a week to two weeks of the culture cycle, uh, most of the hatcheries were getting hit and it was taking out most of the larval production in the country. So there was a lot of modification being done uh, in the techniques and the strategies um, to run the hatchery to try to get uh, the animals to survive in the presence of EMS. And EMS is present. It's always going to be in, in the system now, because again, the animals are coming from the farm. That hasn't changed. So, um, some of the things that Ecuador did to change uh, their management to, to help combat uh, Vibrio uh, uh, culture, or Vibrio affecting their culture, was increase the water temperature, um, that growing the animals faster seemed to help. And most hatcheries are running about 32 degrees or higher. Decreasing the salinity, uh, usually stocking is around 30 to 28 to 30 um, parts per thousand. And by myasis, it's down into the low 20s. Uh, and, and it's kept there uh, until harvest. That also has a negative effect on Vibrio growth. Um, the animals are being transferred uh, from a single culture tank into multiple tanks to lower their density and to put them in a new environment in myosis two, three. 
and feeding rates have dramatically increased uh, to try to accelerate the growth of the larvae. <clears throat> One of the uh, major tools that's uh, helped the hatcheries the most uh, has been uh, an increase in, in the use of probiotics that um, it's, it's gone through a lot of different stages there. But right now, the typical form of probiotic use is to take several strains or cepas of commercially available off the shelf um, bacteria that are being produced, uh, are being sold uh, for their antimicrobial uh, or bio bioremediation capacity. Uh, these uh, strains are then uh, fermented in open tanks uh, for up to 48 hours with molasses is typically the carbon source. Uh, this has helped uh, modulate the microbial population in the tank and has shown consistently to be able to uh, maintain the vibrio population low. Um, it is a, a system that takes a lot more labor space. Um, it brings the cost up on the animals. There's a higher risk involved in it because you are using um, water time in a facility that you and carbon source that's available to the vibrio that you can wind up with the contaminated fermentation and actually cause more problems than you can than you can cure. It's a very artisanal technique, but it is the one that's being practiced today in the vast majority of, of hatcheries. Um, we uh, at Wolford um, were looking at ways that we could simplify the management, lower the risk um, that are that's found from fermenting probiotics at the hatchery level. And we developed an in-feed probiotic and bioremediation uh, blend that is vacuum coated directly onto an experimental uh, extruded diet uh, that's uh, designed to target and modulate the gut uh, and water microbial. Um, in the early stage trials uh, that we had on this blend, we applied it directly to the tank water and we were able to reduce the prevalence of undesirable bacteria, including the family of Vibrio related to EMS. And we saw uh, an improvement in, in, in atrium performance. Um, in this trial, we replaced uh, in a commercial shrimp hatchery uh, that was in full operation doing their normal uh, te techniques, uh, including, including uh, the fermentation of the probiotics. Uh, we compared that to tanks that were, that no fermented probiotics were added and uh, the probiotics that were utilized specifically to control um, the vibrio population to uh, the antimicrobials um, was placed uh, on in a vacuum coat uh, at the time of fabrication uh, here in the U.S. Okay, um, this is the um, uh, the probiotic blend that uh, we uh, are utilizing to top coat the feed. Um, it's made of a yeast extract, oligosaccharides for the carbon source, um, multiple bacillus species for bioremediation, um, and Pediococcus acetylacti, uh, specifically to uh, uh, work as a probiotic protecting the gut of the shrimp. And uh, in that sense, protecting it from how EMS affects the animal. Okay, um, try to get this to the, the test results. Um, we ran, uh, in this comparison here, we're comparing the same family of, of, of stocking nauplii. The tanks that were stocked with the same families. Um, with the Wilford feed, 
uh, versus their normal management techniques in that facility for the control. Uh, in the Wilford test, there's only uh, the feeds, the experimental feed with the bacteria top coated, the probiotic top coated uh, versus the control that had uh, multiple commercial feeds going in. Uh, we did not modify their management in their tanks and we duplicated their management in everything except for how the probiotic was applied and of course, in that sense, the feed. Um, just a little bit on how those tanks were operated, um, that uh, they were stocked in two phases. Nopoli, I uh, stocked in single tanks of 28 uh, tons of water at densities of 420 animals, or Nopoli, uh, per liter, and a salinity of 28 and a temperature of 32. Uh, at myosis two, myosis three, those animals were all harvested and transferred, divided and transferred to two different tanks, uh, each of 28 cubic tons or meters at, with a drop in density of 110, 111 animals per liter. Uh, the salinity at that point had been dropped to 22 parts per thousand and the temperature was maintained at 32 degrees. Uh, the feeding protocol that was utilized uh, was similar in quantities, but it did have some variances. Um, we had the one diet with the probiotic, uh, prebiotic uh, uh, vacuum coating uh, that was utilized from Zoya 1 all the way to uh, harvest. And these animals were harvested at PL9. To, um, have time to be able to summarize the results and present them today. The tanks are actually still in culture. Um, in this summarized, you can see that uh, the amount of feed that went in per million animals uh, was 5,132 grams, basically five, five kilos uh, of, of feed per million animals. And Artemia, there was uh, 6.45 pounds of Artemia uh, that were utilized, Artemia cysts, that were hatched out and utilized uh, uh, in the, for these animals. Okay. This is the, the protocol, the feeding protocol for the control, the normal one for the hatchery there. As you can see, they used a few more diets. Uh, you can see the size ranges, but uh, there's quite a few uh, different commercial diets that are mixed together here, um, kind of complicating how they do their feeding regime, but again, a successful technique. Uh, in total, the, their regime used per million PLs produced 5.8 kilos of <coughs> Um, of me, 5.8 kilos of feed uh, per million larvae of dry feed, uh, one kilo of liquid feed and 5.38, 5.4 kilos or pounds of artemia per million. Um, apart from that, the uh, every feeding there was added an addition of probiotic uh, fermented uh, from their 48 hour fermentation program. Uh, that was pretty much every feeding they would apply that to the water again. Um, all of their feeds were off the shelf feeds, of course. To look at some of the results. Uh, in first phase, the comparison of the Wilford animals uh, versus the control We've got 8 million nuclei stock per tank. Uh, the harvest was very similar at myosis transfer at 6,200,000 uh, for the Wilford and 6,400,000 for them for the control. Survivals were again similar 
77.8% versus 80%, minus the three stages, both. Uh, the size of the animals in Ecuador uh, are measured p uh, larvae per gram. Um, so a higher number, of course, is a smaller animal. That has to be taken into consideration looking at the rest of this. Um, and the animals on the control uh, were actually slightly larger at that point, but really not significantly. Um, and uh, in phase two, after the transfer of into two other tanks, uh, the density is dropping down to 100 per liter. Uh, 3,100,000 animals were stocked in each tank. Uh, the harvest on the Wilford uh, uh, probiotic feed was uh, six, about 70% in both tanks. Uh, and this at PL8 and PL9 were 417 animals per gram and 379. That's about two days ahead of normal staging. Uh, it was a pretty su successful uh, test in that sense. Uh, we had, we saw in the controls um, with stocking density similar uh, that one of the control tanks uh, did give a better survival at 82 percent um, and a, a good growth at 435 animals per gram. Um, but one of the tanks also gave of theirs a 63 percent uh, survival and 737 animals per gram. So there was a lot more spread in the variance there. Um, here we're looking at the, the general combined results and the, the, Wilford, the Wilford treatment, um, 8 million stocked, 4.3 million harvested, survival of about 54%, um, PL8-9 size, and our average was 398 animals per gram, which is typically the size we see at a PL10. So again, it was a robust animal. In the control, um, we stocked 8 million, harvested 4.6 million, survival's in 58%, uh, at, but the animals, Average size animal was quite a bit smaller at 586 animals per gram. This is how, uh, next to that is how the animals uh, compared in PL from PL5 to PL9 in their growth. Uh, and the PL per gram, they started out without very much difference, but uh, in the last three days, the Wolpert animal was able to uh, increase its growth 38, 61, 40% over um, the, uh, the control. And uh, here, apart from uh, just looking at survival and growth, uh, here we're looking at what happened in, in the tank uh, bacteriologically, that uh, samples were taken uh, from the water at four different stages uh, and were looked at under TCBS auger and TSA, uh, specifically looking at um, looking for Vibrio, the type of Vibrio, um, and um, um, heterotrophic bacteria. Uh, what we saw is at both in both uh, regimes and both treatments that the Vibrio populations were very well kept under control. There seriously was not uh, uh, a lot of there was no problems directly related to Vibrio here in either in either treatment, um, and uh, we never saw. Uh, anything that would be a level of, of Vibrio growth that would cause a problem. But we did see that over time uh, th through the samples that 
the feed, uh, the vacuum coated feed had a drop in the Vibrio poke population where uh, there was an actual slight increase in the Vibrio population uh, in the control tanks. Okay. Um, water quality uh, was also looked at, at least nitrites and nitrates. Neither treatment um, uh, gave a level of nitrite or nitrate that was concerning uh, or that caused a problem in, during the tank culture. Um, this is uh, a curve showing uh, the growth of the animal from the different tanks in comparison to the national average uh, of many hatcheries in a program, uh, an app on a phone that uh, they're utilizing now in Ecuador. And it can show how the animal's growth compares to everybody else's hatchery uh, in the country. And uh, a Wilford, the Wilford tank was green, was tank four, and it averaged, uh, pardon me, pardon me, was tank one in the black line. Uh, and it started out about the average, the average size uh, found in hatcheries across the country. And little by little, it gained to where it was at the top of the, uh, of the bar for growth of all the hatcheries uh, currently running. And their normal regime, the protocol, tank four, uh, they had just the opposite. It wound up with some complications and wound up below the, the national average. Um, here in the other set of tanks, uh, tank five, the darker line would be the Wilford and tank uh, seven would be the green line. Uh, here we saw very similar uh, growth that uh, this was the one tank that gave the better results from the control. And they both wound up at the end, uh, at the top end of the national average. Um, we can, these are preliminary tests and we've got to do a lot more work here. Um, but it, we were able to, to show that in a commercial facility that there is the potential uh, to uh, get away from the artisanal fermentation process that hatcheries are having to utilize to be successful. Um, that if we're able to consistently get this type of result, it's going to be a very unique tool uh, that can be a lot more uh, consistent and labor extensive uh, than what they're currently doing. Um, that we're going to continue our work and hopefully be able to present more results in the future. I want to thank everybody uh, and, and pass the, uh, the report on uh, to the next person. Thank you very much, Neil, for this uh, presentation on the application of probiotics in shrimp larval culture. So as agreed upon in the beginning, we move forward to the next presenter and then we give the questions for later. I'm trying to summarize probably a little bit the questions, uh, but our next presenter will be uh, Eamon O'Brien. And uh, Neil has unshared the screen, so Eamon can start sharing. So Eamon has started his uh, aquaculture career in salmon farming but quickly switched to marine larval production where he developed new species technology for several commercial hatch species. He has worked with a Belgian hatchery feed company to provide technical service to marine fish larvae hatcheries and then became a commercial product manager for marine fish. 15 years ago, Eamon joined Scritting to spearhead the development of new speciality unit focused on marine hatchery feeds development. So Squitting has been, uh, done very hard to become the market leader innovator in marine fish larval diets, especially looking and pioneering Artemia replacement, rotifer production, and offering a level of local services and technical backup. In parallel to that, 
Energies have been focused on developing also new generation shrimp hatchery diets to simplify and improve production processes. So today, Iman is going to talk to us about marine fish hatchery innovations for feeding the future. So Iman, I hope that in the meanwhile, you are able to share your screen. Which yes, I hope you can see it. I should be Not sharing yet. I see you, which is also very nice. Okay. <laughs> prefer your presentation. I'll go back again and share it again. Yes. And off we go. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone, and greetings from Belgium. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Lucia and Melissa and the team at uh, Hatchery FM and also to you, Professor Bossier, for uh, putting these uh, webinars together and inviting me to present to you today. Uh, today I'll talk about uh, marine hatchery feed innovations for feeding the future. So in the, in the 15 minutes I have available, it's impossible to cover all of the marine hatcheries. Uh, last August I covered uh, shrimp hatcheries and that is available on YouTube. Uh, Lucia uh, can provide the link. So today I'll focus um, most of my presentation on marine fish hatcheries. Uh, a little word about Scretting, who we are, first of all. Uh, we are a global leader in our industry. Uh, we have uh, 30 production plants in 18 countries, uh, producing in excess of 2.3 million metric tons of feed. So we are firmly rooted in the aquaculture production chain. We're deeply involved in feeding many species in many different locations. The total number of species we are producing feeds for is approximately 60. And through our global network, we are in a position to service the technical demands of these different species groups at a local and global level. Specialized hatchery diets are a key part of that offering. And for that, uh, we have identified a long time ago that life start sets like performance. As Jan mentioned very correctly in his presentation as well, the life start is a critical phase in the overall production of fish and shrimp. Life start defines the feed products that are fed to larvae in, and fry in the first few weeks or months of their life. In addition, the feeds given to the parent animals, i.e. the broodstock, of course, will influence the quality and yield of egg production and thus larval fry quality and number. But it's not just about the feeds themselves. It's about how those feeds influence and interact with their environment, the workload for the operators, and ultimately offer stability in production and output. But life start sets life performance. Uh, producing feed for marine larvae is no simple task. Uh, it requires specific competence in novel production technologies, but also very unique ingredients, which must all be sustainably sourced and approved for use in the aquaculture feed chain. Hatcheries are a very serious and technical business that demand the best quality and most importantly, consistency in supply and quality. Situated in the north of France is our facility dedicated to early life start diets. They are specialized in lifey diets, larval diets and nursery diets, utilizing a number of different production expertise for these 60 different species and life stages. From there, products are exported to more than 50 country, countries, either directly to end users or for further distribution through the Scretting Global Operating Company Network. Now, a marine fish hatchery is a very complex and multidisciplinary organism. Specific departments, such as broodstock, live feed and larva rearing, etc., focus on delivering their specialization to support the overall production objectives. Uh, each segment requires precision and consistency for a stable production and the best quality of dry production. So let's quickly run through some of these different departments to look at how Scretting and also others are working together with the hatchery experts around the world and scientists to try to continue our mission for feeding the future. If we go on to broodstock, first of all, I think it's uh, yeah, very, very important to have a look at. They are the beating heart of the, of the hatchery, um, whether it's uh, managed on site or larvae are outsourced. Uh, broodstock quality directly influences hatchery success. Both the hatchery, both the shrimp and marine fish industry still rely on uh, the use of fresh feeds. But the elimination of certain wildcard high risk fresh feeds is already common in certain countries, uh, together with the use of high quality formulated diets. This will become more standard to help maintain, for instance, the SPF status of broodstock and quality offspring. Genetic gains that are being developed. Uh, 
um, whether they are growth and or more robust animals, still require feeds that are not contaminated with or sourced from regions with infectious diseases. The replacing fresh feeds demands as much a mindset hurdle as a nutritional challenge. Spreading ARC, our research arm, has, through international research collaborations over 30 years, focused on the development of diets for fish and shrimp foodstock, which is presented in our Vitalis range. One of the primary targets of the Vitalis uh, range has been to eliminate the use of fresh feeds in broodstock nutrition. In shrimp, we have already successfully eliminated the need for polychaetes and bloodworms, but there's still work to be done to eliminate all fresh feeds from the broodstock feeding programs. In marine fish with Vitalis cow, we have already demonstrated that fresh feeds can be completely eliminated from the broodstock feeding program. And these experiments uh, shown uh, before you, uh, which were carried out on sea bream in Gran Canaria in Spain, we were able to demonstrate uh, increased egg production, spawning duration, and also egg quality composition. Over the last few years, our researchers at Scudding ARC have been working on developing this concept further for candidate aquaculture species. Seriola is a species that holds a lot of promise for aquaculture, and we've been working on trying to improve reproductive success with this species. It was noted that supplementing the Telescal with mackerel was the standard method, and three theories were investigated. The effect of increasing protein in the diet, of increasing chlorine in the diet, and also increasing histidine in the diets were measured against the control group of uh, animals fed Vitalis cow plus mackerel. The fish group fed the diet supplemented with histidine showed a significant improvement in total egg production, fertilization, and yolk sac larval survival. This work has been published in the paper Aquaculture and was part of the EU Diversify project. So this development, along with other key user upgrades, such as improved compatibility with RAS systems, has been commercially implement, implemented in our latest foodstock diet, Vitalis Prima. Moving on to live feed, is it a friend or a foe? It all depends, I suppose, on uh, your experiences and your expertise. Um, but the production of quality live feed remains essential for the success of most marine fish species. Uh, rotifers are utilized as first feeding prey until day 30 for some species, and our team are utilized from around about day 17 onwards, and they can be fed out to approximately day 55 to 60, although modern facilities will complete weaning by day 40, 45. However, depending on the species being reared, there can be enormous differences, of course. In the case of sea bream, with a production of approximately 550 million fry, Rotifers tend to represent around 10% of the total production cost and Artemia around 20%. However, combined, they represent around 85% of the total feed costs in the hatchery. So they play a major role in hatchery success and profitability. Overall, bream can be reared very successfully without the use of Artemia, while bass is typically reared without the use of rotifers. A rotifer production has often been a key bottleneck in marine fish production. Uh, the ability to produce copious quantities of high quality rotifers for first feeding is essential for larval success. Uh, over the past years, uh, production of rotifers has become much more streamlined, uh, less problematic, and there's been more intensification of the production systems through the use of more advanced rotifer culture diets. Production of rotifers, of course, still remains a subset of producing fish. So most recently advances have been made to further simplify the production process and ensure that greater nutrition and microbial stability of the rotifers. This has been achieved by removing the separate enrichment process uh, completely from the cycle so that rotifers can be taken at any moment to feed young larvae. Having plenty of good quality rotifers available makes it relatively easy to produce a number of species with reduced or zero artemia. Well, this uh, brings me on, of course, to artemia. Uh, there was quite some discussion about this yesterday as well. Um, artemia have helped underpin larval fish and shrimp developments uh, throughout the world. But their use or dependency has also introduced significant challenges in larval rearing. It's essential to ensure that artemia are disinfected before feeding and to avoid excess artemia feeding. It is also useful to understand the natural variations that Artemia exhibit based on the different strains of Artemia, 
and the year classes of Artemia and the impacts that these changes can have on production, predictability, reproducibility and total stability. Artemia typically represent, represents around 55% of the total feed costs in a hatchery. Its use can be limited, and we'll talk a bit more about this in a moment, um, but off the shelf, ready to use disinfected Artemia monopoly have become available. This innovation simplifies the hatchery procedures and eliminates the large variations that exist within Artemia hatching at a hatchery level. Longer term, we expect more freedom of choice with further developments and up to adoption of advanced formulated diets and alternative superior live feeds. But how can we make um, our team here we use today better? Well, the use of new generation enrichment products uh, such as Orien 3, which don't rely on eutrophic oil-based emulsions can increase the overall quality and vitality of the Artemia. In this way, we can tackle the nutritional and bacterial variations that can complicate the use of Artemia. In Scretting, we've developed this algal-based enrichment free from any fish oils or emulsifiers. And this simple to use product maintains a very clean enrichment environment and actually feeds the Artemia to increase protein biomass and incorporate maximum amounts of DHA. Dosage and duration of the enrichment can be tailored to suit However, you would like to work in your hatchery if it's 12 hour, 10 hour, 24 hour enrichment protocol. And of course, depending on the nutritional profile that you wish to achieve for the species that you are targeting. It was great to see uh, Jan's presentation earlier as well. I think it's, uh, it's very interesting as an industry for us to talk about alternative live feeds. It's an interesting development that has been building up uh, is the use of these natural zooplankton or copepods in marine larval production. Uh, long known to be superior to Artemia, their use has been hampered by lack of availability, cost and complexities in production. But in more recent years, commercial companies have now emerged offering viable zooplankton alternatives in convenient, easy to use forms that improve growth and survival. Some products have even been shown to have the possibility to replace rotifers. For these solutions to gain traction, hatchery managers need assurance that they can produce their animals with the same or better consistency as what they do today. Trust in the product and trust in the supplier that they can meet these assurances is key. This also very much applies, of course, to dry feeds. And when we look back to the most recent innovations in dry diets and scretting, algae and nature has been at the core of what we do. It forms the core of the natural food chain for larvae. So its incorporation only seems logical in formulated diets, whether they are destined for live feed or for dry formulated diets. Larval diets have also improved with greater scientific understanding of the nutritional requirements and improved production technologies, offering cleaner and more stable feed particles. This has also been mirrored with many improved technological husbandry enhancements, such as, but of course not limited to, automated feeding systems for live feed and dry diets, better control of the redox potential in the water and automatic bottom cleaning systems, which continues to grow at an astounding pace. Collectively, these uh, improvements will open new possibilities to address the constraints that hamper actually today's production. Uh, the importance of technical expertise uh, when we come to Artemia substitution or changing protocols within a hatchery to adapt new feeds, whether it's alternative live feeds, is incredibly important. Te technical expertise is so evident, um, or its importance is so evident as we progress in normalizing these new feeds and production methodologies in a hatchery, industrial hatchery production. As a quick example, when applying Gemma Micro for Artemia replacement, uh, I will show you some um, work that was uh, presented a few years ago at uh, Larvae. Um, but it's already good to remind ourselves that um, our team replacement is already being done um, for millions of different fish and it's been shown as well for numerous different species. Um, it just needs a different way of larval culture approach. It's not difficult, it's just different. Um, but technical expertise, of course, uh, plays a key role. Um, Scredding, well, I, I said to you about uh, 
an example from uh, larvae. So this was uh, first presented by Dr. Philip Dirt at uh, larvae in 2017. It's an example for a sea bass. And in this instance, uh, we were demonstrating the concept of no weaning. Um, so we modified the classic rearing approach to start with uh, a first feeding of uh, just the micro diet and then follow up with a small, as we called it, a kiss of artemia for just a few days. So in, an, in essence, we are replacing the weaning process by not getting the larvae hooked on artemia in the first place. And we can see that under different um, amounts of artemia offered, it was very safe with CBAS to go down to 2.5 kilos of artemia per million fish produced, which is almost zero. Uh, we could achieve normal growth, uh, survival in excess of 60%, and malformations approximately 5%. These are scientific malformations. So it's certainly possible, and we're also without any need for road furs in this, in this uh, type of production as well. So such a system enables higher fish stocking densities, which allows in turn for a more economical return on capital infrastructure employed. Of course, the success of a diet is much more than uh, um, just nutrition. As previously mentioned in our larval presentation, the success of the diet is more than nutrition. All aspects of the diet management must be controlled with technical precision. So for instance, uh, light quality, photo period, uh, water movement, and so forth. The responsibility to produce safe, nutritious, and reliable, sustainable seafood is real. Unfortunately, in scretting, we recognize the need to have hatchery experts close on hand to assist your production. The success of our place in the industry depends first and foremost on our people and their commitment to produce and provide the best diets and service to you. Our marine hatchery feed team bring real world production expertise to support your business. Essentially, our future food needs must be met in the most responsible, efficient and safe ways possible. And all commercial food production sectors have an obligation to strike this balance. Thankfully, there are ways for us to do this. Breakthrough solutions are at hand, new thinking, new innovations and new technologies, coupled with new raw material ingredients are coming to the fore that will enable us to collectively feed the future. Uh, please feel free to follow us on scratching.com, on LinkedIn and Twitter for more information. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Eamon, for your presentation. Uh, that would allow us to feed forward to the last presentation. I can see that in the meanwhile, our audience was uh, extremely active after the first presentation. It's sort of a cool down now. So I, I like to encourage the audience to keep on firing questions at our speakers. Um, I'm following that uh, Q&A at the moment to try to summarize the questions that might pop up uh, after the last presentation. So our, our last presenter is Joan Eric. He's researcher and product manager, manager at Sparos in Portugal. His main activities are focused on the research and development of tailored nutritional solutions for fish larvae and the management of Sparos commercial hatchery feed products. He gained hands-on experience with different aquaculture species and production systems and managed several production commercialization product, projects sorry, while working in companies such as Scottish Sea Farms and Cargill. So today, Joao has a presentation for us on the key role of tailored nutrition at larval stages, from flatfish to fast-growing fish species. I hope you are still there, Joao. Thank you very much, Peter. Can you hear me? Yes, we can okay. hear you. And Perfect. if you are able to share your screen, we are all set. Okay. Are you able to see the screen? Yeah, you can go. Perfect, okay. Well, thank you so much, Peter, for the introduction. And I would like to thank as well to Hatchery Feed and Management for the invitation for this webinar. And well, thanks for everyone that joined the webinar. I know that this is a rough time for some people. This is lunchtime in some of, uh, some of the countries in Europe. So I hope I can, you know, we can, you can keep, keep up with the presentation uh, and I hope you enjoy it. So again, I am Joan Rix, researcher and product manager at Sparus, um, which is a company that is based in Portugal and it was founded in 2008. 
So it's 12 uh, plus years old. And is a company that um, focuses a lot on feeding nutrition for aquaculture and innovation within this, within this sector. Um, so basically, with uh, Sparus has developed a lot uh, of a lot of uh, diets uh, within the past years. And in this case, we're talking about um, commercial winning diets. And this was in partnership with some uh, universities, research centers, and also with key customers. So at the moment, we have some other projects going on uh, and the projects focus on uh, the use of functional components and also anti-stress larval feeds. So this is our main focus and also projects that focus on first feeding uh, micro diets. And this is to try to um, decrease the time where we introduce inert feeds uh, at larval stages. Uh, and on the other hand, we also work with different species, always trying to produce new micro diets. And among these species, I would like to highlight balanras, pike perch, uh, and others. So amongst the portfolio of Sparrow's commercial winning diets, I would like to highlight two. So Winflat and Winfast. Winflat is our premium winning micro diet for flatfish and is suitable for species, including Senegalese sole, which is a species uh, that actually we put uh, a lot of research effort uh, when we made this diet. And it's also suitable for olive flounder, Atlantic halibut, and turbot. On the other hand, we have uh, a second premium micro diet, in this case, for growing, for fast growing fish species. And the species includes amberjack, yellowtail, and meager. We also tested this diet with other species, including sea bass and sea bream, with very good results. So when we talk about making a winning diet, we need to talk about the combined approach. Um, so first of all, we need to consider the nutritional requirements of each fish species, talking about macronutrients, micronutrients, and we need to choose premium ingredients in order to deliver the required nutritional profiles. So ingredients with high digestibility levels. And of course, it's crucial and very important, then we adapt the physical properties of the diet to each fish species and each aquaculture systems. And therefore, we are working on a very narrow area, which is only accomplished through the use of high technology. And with technology, I mean with the latest extrusion technologies and micro encapsulation technologies. So to tailor larval micro diets, we're talking about diets usually within the range from 80 to 800 microns, give or take, depending on the species. We can have a lot of different combinations of nutrients within a very small pellet, which means that there are a lot of trials and a lot of research projects that we can do in order to find the best combinations to increase growth performance and health status of the fish larvae. So I could talk to you a lot about all the trials that we do, all the studies and all the projects that we have with customers, but I decided to find to focus here on uh, three specific areas. So I will introduce a trial with binders where we tested binders at different levels in one fish species. And then I'll move on to trials that we've done with additives and also with different lipid levels. Here, we've done these trials with different fish species and uh, we had different responses to a specific stimulus or treatment. So to start with the trials uh, with binders. So binders, as we know, in aquaculture are fundamental to keep pellet stability and also to keep and maintain good water quality of the systems. In this first trial, uh, we utilize the species Senegalese sole, and we started the trial at 30 days, and we prolonged it at 65 days after hatch. And this one specifically, I'll just use the pointer. 
we had an alternative binder, which we added to diet at different concentrations. So we had at low level, medium level, and high level, and we had our commercial control diet. So as you can see here, higher inclusions of the binder were linked to improved performance when we compare to the control diets. In this case, total length was significantly higher in Senegalese salt. Just ahead in this trial, there were no significant differences in survival and in FCR. When we go a little bit more in depth and we talk about uh, a specific area of the diet, in this case, linked to physical properties, we also measured the protein leaching of the diet. So in this case, it's the amount of protein that is lost to the water. And we had two different measurements. The first one, two minutes after the, the feed gets in contact with water. And the second one is 30 minutes after the contact. And as you can see here in the chart, we have a big reduction in leaching if we compare the control diet to the diets with medium and high inclusions of the alternative binder. So overall, we talk about a 57% reduction in protein leaching, which means that the nutrients will be more available to the fish larvae and they are not lost to the water. So basically, alternative binders at medium and high levels allowed a reduction in leaching, which is most probably linked to an improved in performance in Senegalese soil. So moving on to some of the trials we've done with feed additives. And in this case, the main target is to increase growth performance and also to increase immune status of the fish and to improve antioxidant systems. So here we have two trials. The first one, again, with Senegalese sole from 30 days to 70 days after hatch, where we have our control diet and we have the control diet with an additive, in this case, with curcumin extract. And at the end of the trial, as you can see, Senegalese sole that fed on the diet with the curcumin extract showed an improved performance and improved wet weight. Not only wet weight was improved, but there was also a good trend in length, condition factor, and oxidative stress response was also improved. However, when we, change, when we, we use the same additive in a different species, in this case, sea bass, we see that the response is totally different. So here we have an example where the curcumin extract actually was, were linked to a significantly lower dry weight at the end of the trial. And also, not only the weight, but total length, RGR and FCR were also decreased in comparison with the control diet. Moving on to the third group of trials. In this case, we've tested different uh, lipid levels with potential benefits on growth performance and also on larval quality. And here we have several trials with different species uh, with, with which we analyze the results at the end. So the first one was with CBAS from 23 days to 56 days after hatch. And we used, in these cases, was a benchmark um, trial as well. So we had a commercial diet that was from a competitor with 62% protein and 17% lipids. And we have three test diets produced at Sparush. One with medium fat DHA, the other one with high fat DHA. So these two diets had a different lipid source, which was DHA rich. And we had a diet with the highest fat level, 20% with recurrent uh, lipid raw material sources used in fish feeds. When we look into the results, uh, it's important to note that there were no significant differences in survival. It was actually good survival, all above 75, 75%. But we saw that there were actually no significant differences between uh, final dry weight of the commercial diet and the high fat diet. So basically CBAS that fed on the commercial diet and the high fat diet 
had no significant differences in final dry weight. However, if we look a little bit more into the specifics, in this case, if we talk about the accumulation of fat in the liver cells, which in this chart is translated by liver vacuolization area, we see that this actually this factor was increased, significantly increased in, in the fish that fed the commercial diet. So all the test diets showed actually lower lipid vacuolization area, which means that um, the lipid quality or the lipid source quality is much, much more important that sometimes the lipid quantity when it comes to keep a good health status of the fish larvae. On a second trial, we used it in a different species, in this case with MIGR, and we had the same, this was a benchmark trial as well, so the same commercial competitor diet. And in this case, we used the medium fat diet and a high fat diet. And if we look into the results, we see that MIGR that fed on a high fat diet not only presented significantly higher dry weight, but also had the highest survival. And in this case, all treatments actually had normal lipid vacuolization in liver. One last example. And here we talk about a trial with Senegalese soul from 31 days to 65 days after hatch, where we compared uh, a medium fat diet and a high fat diet. And in this case, we saw completely different results. So Senegalese soul that actually fed on a high fat diet showed significantly lower dry weight at the end of the trial, and also significantly higher feed conversion ratio. So the opposite, in this, in this case, the effect of the high fat diet was completely opposite from the previous species uh, that I showed. And here, there were no significant differences in survival, so all above 80%. So if we sum up the results of the larval microdiet lipid trials, we see that if we talk about CBAS and MIGR, we actually relate it to an increase in growth of 31% and 28% and completely opposite effect that the high fat diets have on soul, which revealed a decrease in growth of 22%. And these may be linked as well to the type of um, process of metabolization of fats in soul. So soul is not as an active species as CBAS and MIGR, and therefore the energy requirement must be slightly less than these species. So as final remarks, uh, I would like to highlight the fact that microdiet formulation and physical properties should go hand in hand. We do believe that it is crucial to modulate physical properties and adapt it to each fish species, just to make sure that we optimize uh, performance and also the opportunity for all the larvae to feed on the inert diets. Also distinct fish species have different biological responses, in this case to specific feed additives. So it's important to continue on testing and understand what are the responses according to different fish species. And dietary lipid levels influence larval performance and also larval health. And again, we saw very different results when I talk about changing lipid profiles or lipid levels uh, depending on each fish species. So just to sum up, uh, when it comes to a uh, larval winning diet, we do think that there's no one size that fits all. There's a lot of work to be done. And in this case, we do believe that tailored nutrition for fish larvae is the key in order to continue to optimize micro diets in terms of nutrition, physical properties, just so uh, all the species can have an opportunity to have the best performance possible. 
within a specific agriculture system that they, they, they have. And that's all for me. So I'd like to thank you, everyone. Thank you very much to everyone. And I am available to answer some of the questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Juan. Uh, so here we come to the end of the four presentations for this afternoon. And uh, if that is okay with Lucia and the organizers of this uh, webinar, I guess we can move on to the Q&A session. Yes, please move on. Okay. So as the presentations were ongoing, some questions were coming in. And as already mentioned uh, a while ago, there was quite a lot of questions for Jan, basically. Uh, Jan, I, I tried to summarize. There are questions in relation to egg production capacity, basically. How is that saying that? Can the market be supplied with copy pot eggs at, the, at this moment? So it, it is highly dependent on what market uh, we are talking of. Uh, I mean, the, the fish larval market, uh, yes. I mean, if we are talking about the complete Asian shrimp market, then we, we need to have bigger, uh, bigger facilities. I mean, in general, we are, uh, we are improving our, uh, our production and also, uh, yeah, improving our uh, production capacity. Okay. Uh, there are also quite a lot of questions on uh, the possibility of applying copy pots in tropical species and freshwater species. And so the question is how, how broadly can copy pots be applied? Yeah, so, so in general, uh, the copy pots can be uh, used uh, very broadly. I, I already tried to answer some of the questions in the ch chat, uh, but uh, yeah, tropical species are working great. Um, I, I've also, uh, also seen a question on, uh, for example, uh, using cup pots in, uh, in mesocosms. Uh, that is al uh, also, uh, there the, the cup pots can really do a big difference, especially uh, they are, not losing uh, the, the nutritional value. They are staying basically in the water column. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the, the fish larvae can feed on them for a long period of time. Uh, we're still having, uh, having a nutritional be benefit. And that is one of the key factors what makes uh, copper pots so great as a, as a feed, um, that the, the nutritional value that is basically pushed into, into for example, the rotifers, um, that we don't have this scenario or this, this situation that the copper pots are having itself a good, good nutritional value and uh, yeah, keep that for a long period of time. Okay, probably I move to very, some very practical questions that people had some issues about uh, export permits and probably linked to it biosecurity and the possibility of ordering online so can you handle this type of questions yes so uh by uh ordering uh, ordering online you can you can order by uh, contacting us uh directly i think we we don't have an on online shop yet uh that is still uh, some uh, some time to to go would be perfect. I would love it actually. Um, I mean, yeah, the the question regarding um, transportation issues. I mean, uh, logistical uh, logistical wise uh, in the in the actual situation with uh, with, with the COVID situation, uh, it is a challenge. Uh, we are we are doing our best to. Uh, to, to supply and uh, also supplying uh, um, yeah, the world market. But uh, yes, for sure, uh, there is, uh, is some issues, but we are working on it and we can supply most of it or, or most of, of the countries, yeah. Of course, there were also some uh, economical financial questions, basically. Uh, on, on the price of the product and probably uh, if I summarize it also a bit, the overall cost benefit of applying uh, copy pots. I mean, uh, has this been, uh, have there been any attempts to really calculate 
the cost benefit of applying copper pots? Yes, of course, uh, there, there is. So we, we have reduced uh, our, our prices uh, quite drastically over the, over the last, uh, last years. So, uh, so that is a good thing in general. We have to, uh, to still say, okay, uh, copper pots uh, are quite costly, but uh, nevertheless, um, we, are, we are also bringing a lot of beneficial uh, effects uh, with uh, using copper pots uh, to the table. So of course it, it is a balance and uh, then it also very much depends on uh, what species you're, you're feeding. I mean, you can, uh, can use quite a lot more copper pots for example, feeding a relatively expensive uh, species uh, like uh, like the Bellamress in in Norway, uh, in comparison to when we are talking to, uh, about uh, about uh, yeah uh, a lower price species like sea bream or, or sea bass, um, and then uh, the different feeding regimes come uh, come in. Uh, so basically, what feeding regime is vi viable for uh, for what species and what uh, what facility? Is it possible to give something like uh, an indication of the price per million eggs or something like that, uh, or can people find it on the website eventually? Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, there there is. Uh, yeah, uh, ba basic best best way is uh, to co contact us. Uh, it is also very dependent on the quantity of uh, of uh, copper pots you're you're requiring. So yeah, the best way is uh, just contacting us, and uh, we can basically give you a exact number with uh, with also uh, the cost of transport. To your different uh, different location. Okay, thank you, Jan. Probably it's time to move on to the second presenter. I guess uh, Q and A can still be put a uh, cues in the Q and A box for the time being. We can always come back if uh, needed. So Neil, uh, if we move on to you, uh, probably I can start with a personal question. Uh, if you can probably switch on your camera, Neil, if you're still there, hoping. Uh, my camera. Yes, yeah, there you are. Okay, you I see can me? See you. Yeah, I can <laughs> see you. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, my first question that came up when you were presenting, are those cases of EMS you are presenting real AHP and D cases, or is it just a... a, a oh, no, they are, they are. Therapy. I didn't go into a, a lot of detail, but yes, they're... Um, uh, indicative of of uh, 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 AHPND um, syndrome that um, when it hit, it was very unique um, that uh, we uh, didn't know what we were seeing to begin with, but fortunately from the work that Dr. Leitner had done, um, we were able to uh, identify that uh, it was uh, the EMS that had uh, been seen previously in other parts of the world. Um, that we don't see that type of mortality from any other type of Vibrio infection. Uh, it is so quick. It's a, it's a direct toxicity that will turn a beautiful, healthy, active tank in a matter of hours into a white, dead, mass uh, it's a very very distinctive and you don't misinterpret it okay and do you also know if that is only observed in latin america ecuador uh this hp and the ems problem in, in in the hatchery phase or also ever somewhere else in the world um in from my understanding we we were not able to find uh at the time where this was an extreme problem uh, many examples of, of other countries they were having the same problem. And we associated that directly with uh, the broodstock programs that Ecuador had, con had gone a unique path uh, and had closed the cycle, bringing animals 
to the farm and then back again into the hatchery system. Um, and without having an isolated uh, SPF type uh, quarantined disease free uh, nucleus breeding center. They were brought in with all of their diseases uh, and left to, to, to either breed or, or die uh, in the maturation system. And everything that was in the ponds was brought into the hatchery. Um, there were disinfection techniques, uh, washing techniques that helped dis, uh, lower the, the, the load, the bacterial load and the viral load. Um, but it certainly wasn't eliminated. And once it got into these hatchery systems, a lot of the hatcheries, like a lot of parts of the world, are side by side and they cross contaminate. Uh, the one's discharging where the other one's taking water in. Once that happened, it was just a cycle that wasn't, that wasn't stoppable. Um, the rest of the world, pretty much at that time frame, uh, didn't use broodstock from ponds. Uh, they still don't. Uh, they're coming all from SPF programs, which uh, keeps the hatchery clean and keeps the hatchery production going smoothly, but it sends the animals out to the farm that don't necessarily have the tolerance to the disease. So Ecuador's kind of been a, a experimental ground on trying to control EMS that's going to be in the hatchery uh, to have an animal that is tolerant to it in the farm. Okay. Another question for you, also a little bit from a personal side. I was uh, interested to hear about at least uh, the, the custom, the habit of uh, hatcheries to do proper fermentation on, on fermentation on farms of, if I understood correctly, origin of species, which is not very well defined. They make mixtures. And then I was also wondering, do they follow up on what they are actually culturing in those fermentations? Because the way you explained it didn't look very controlled to me. No, it's very artisanal. Uh, and the results are, um, are sometimes uh, inconsistent to say the least. Uh, larger groups, everybody in, in Ecuador at the farm level uh, are fermenting bacterial strains at the farm and applying them to the ponds. I would say the same is the case in the hatcheries. Um, that it is artisanal, but uh, the large groups have quality control departments where they will be doing isolates of, of the cultures before they're added to the tank or to the pond. Uh, but the vast majority don't, that they do cookbook recipe and they don't have a quality control uh, check and balance system that uh, they can cause as much problems as they can cure, uh, particularly at the, at the, the small producers level. Then uh, probably a question that came up, I, I came up in the q and I think, is that uh, what, in your opinion, is it uh, better to follow TCBS counts, Vibrio, in the water or in the animal? Or is, is one of them sufficient? Or uh, should we go straight for TCBS counts in, in, in the animals? Um, well, we, we do both. That mm -hmm. uh, typically what we're, we're concerned about uh, is from uh, the Maserata, from uh, squished animals uh, that are plated out. Uh, but we also monitor our water column, both coming in and uh, in the tank itself. So uh, everything is pretty much looked at there. Um, inside the animal is probably the most critical because what we're trying to do is control the bacteria that are in the gut. Uh, and that seems to be uh, sufficient to be able to avert the MS problem. Okay, thank you. So, Eamon, probably I can move on to you. Uh, probably uh, Jan and uh, uh, Neil, you can also check the Q&A. If I have missed an important question, please signal that to me. Eamon, uh, one of, I saw one question coming up. Of course, people are interested in knowing what your ORIEN3 is all about. <laughs> is that uh, something that can be... Yeah, sure, of course. Uh, yeah, it's uh, a blend of uh, heterotrophically grown uh, Schizohytria martinia, uh, algae, sorry, um, together with... Uh, just, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But it's a specific uh, strain and uh, 
treated in a, or manufactured in a specific way that allows it to allows us to get really really high levels of DHA into the artemia and to maintain it because well as you know they they break down DHA as pretty much as quick as you can get it into them so we managed to get in, in excess of uh, three to one DHA EPA ratios. Uh, there was also a guess a question if I'm correct on 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 uh, the potential risks for diseases by micro encapsulated uh, diets. I'm not sure I understand the question. Is it... Well, I guess there, there was a question if, if micro encapsulated diets, micro diets, is there any disease uh, risk associated with that as well, or is, is that uh, like uh, well? The concept that there are risk associated with life di life diets, themia, rotifers. Yeah, I think anything that you bring into the hatchery, of course, is a vector. So it uh, it, it always has uh, the potential. Um, what we, of course, uh, do is uh, make sure that all of our diets are produced uh, using aseptic techniques uh, and that they're stored under nitrogen. Uh, we use actually the principles of um, standard human food and meat processing uh, hygiene standards for our, all of our feed production. Um, so yeah, we, there's always a risk, but we of course uh, try to source all of our uh, raw materials uh, from areas where diseases aren't present. So for instance, uh, we don't uh, produce our feeds in Asia, they're produced in France. So we're not uh, taking uh, raw materials from a, an area where shrimp is being produced or using, for instance, shrimp in shrimp feeds and so on. Okay. Uh, probably an, a next question I might have, I don't know if it came up in the Q&A session, what is the state of knowledge on the issue of deformities in relation to uh, micro diets at this moment? Uh, uh, yes, a very, very complex question uh, with multiple answers. Uh, there's no <laughs> one, one single uh, golden bullet that will uh, remove deformities. I think uh, the key thing is, uh, is to recognize is that deformities are a fact. They still exist uh, today in the industry. They haven't gone away. Um, so various approaches are required, more, of course, nutritional understanding, um, better understanding of how to actually apply the diets. But it's not only about uh, nutrition, of course, uh, understanding uh, better genetics as well and better genetic uh, programs as well to try to um, filter these genes out of the, the total gene pool. Mm -hmm. And so in, in your opinion, in, in which, uh, for which pieces have... Uh, these micro diets penetrated more into the market, replacing a live feed? Um, well, we can go, first of all, to, let's say, the um, medicinal market. So, for instance, uh, zebrafish, which have traditionally been uh, reared with um, uh, rotifers and artemia. Uh, now it's common practice. In fact, the industry standard is to, to feed zebrafish on Gemma Micro and not to use artemia. Um, other diets uh, that we've successfully demonstrated on a commercial scale, of course, is uh, barramundi, cod, sea bass, and sea bream as well. But the adaptation of this is uh, very much dependent on a number of different factors, as I tried to explain as well in the presentation. The diet itself is, is a tool, and it's how you actually utilize that tool and how you can utilize that tool in your available infrastructure is, is very key. Uh, you can have indeed a really, really good diet and you can have uh, less than optimal results with it. Likewise, you can use a, a less than optimal diet and get satisfactory results for your, uh, for your needs, in fact. Okay. So thanks for this, uh, for these answers. And probably that at this stage, I move on to Joan for the first time. So so I guess Ron probably have seen the questions also in the Q&A. Of course, people are interested in knowing uh, what binder we are talking about in, in your presentation. Yeah, so uh, we do you know, different trials. We test different binders all the time. They might have a specific uh, effect on a certain species or a certain diet. And you know, we are currently you know, trying different options to understand what are the ones that can have a best, a better impact on performance and also on water quality in the system because it's very important. Mm -hmm. So um, and these binders are used, you know, within the industry. I'm not 100 percent sure that I can you know tell you exactly which one it is from the trial. Um, 
because uh, it's not, uh, you know, uh, for example, as curcumin is not the patented one. But what I can tell is that we, you know, we try a lot of different combinations just to make sure I, or to try to understand what's the impact on the systems and within, you know, the performance of different species and uh, what might be, you know, best for one species or one system might not be best for the other, as we've seen. So this is, you know, a constant back and forth between, you know, Sparus, our key customers, and also the feedback we have from research institutions and, and the industry overall. Looking, uh, especially looking at your, one of your last slides where you explained uh, how different fish react to diets with the high, low and high fat content. Yeah. So uh, do we know anything about the physiological basis for these differential responses in, in fish? Uh, well, it, for example, in the case of uh, sole, when I compare sole with uh, sea bream, uh, sea bass, meager, actually we've done more, uh, we've done more trials with different species. Uh, I couldn't put them all together, otherwise it would be an often hour presentation. Uh, but for example, species like amberjack, um, sea bass or sea bream, they have you know, a high energy requirement. They are an active species, so they use a lot of energy and they metabolize, metabolize it quite well. Whilst species such as sole, they are more quiet, relaxed. So therefore, you know, the, the amount of energy through fat that they need might be slightly lower. And therefore, um, uh, the results that we've seen when we change the lipid levels. So, so that's pretty much that. And then also just a little note on the quality of lipids, because We've seen as well in some of the in some of the species when we analyze the liver cells, some of the liver cells had a higher vacuolization, which means that the lipids are instead of rather than being used for metabolic energy, they are stored. So um, whilst with other lipid sources, uh, we didn't see that. Um, so in our view, you know, one of the possible reasons is that. Um, the quality of lipids that we use in our diets is very, very important, rather than sometimes the quantity of lipids. So this is one of the conclusions that you know we had when we trial different lipid levels and lipid sources with all those species. So that's an important point to make as well. Thank you, uh, Jan. I'm going back to you. Probably you have following been following the Q and A. Did I miss any important question there? Um, yeah. <laughs> um, there, there are a couple, um, maybe uh, regarding uh, um, uh, regarding using copper pots instead of a tenia. Um, I, I think, especially for fish larvae, um, also uh, it is very important to feed the right size at the right uh, moment. And our copper pots uh, are, quite, uh, are smaller than Artemia. So uh, that's why, uh, why um, we are at the moment aiming for, for the, for the ro rotifer phase and uh, replacing more rotifers. Um, and the Artemia phase basically with a different size, uh, larvae can just get a bigger portion of, uh, of fat and protein by catching one uh, one artemia, so uh, maybe it can be a, as a yeah as a vitamin pill uh, or, or an additional feeding to improve basically the nutritional quality, but as a complete replacement for for artemia, um, there there are uh, is is at least with a nautli quite critical. You can also ungrow the copper pots, but that is also then requiring a lot of microalgae at your facility and uh, we are talking about uh, a different setup there but that could be an could be an option as well thank you uh, Neil I guess there was still a question for you in relation to what type of bacteria you, are, you have been using in the test you have explained yes um, in our um, vacuum coated uh, feeds, uh, the blend that we used um, had a specific strain of uh, Pediococcus acetylactide, 
bed um, uh, is a basically a freeze dried uh, bacteria that once rehydrated uh, becomes uh, activated again. Uh, and we also include six species of, of bacillus uh, specifically that have enzyme production uh, and high bioremediation um, effect. Uh, we're including in there also some yeast extracts uh, and uh, uh, a FOSS, uh, an oligosaccharide source, carbon source. Uh, do you know if every single species has its additional effect and if there is any synergism to be detected or is that uh, the composition is a little bit more, uh, let's say, not that designed? Uh, well, there, uh, there is a synergist synergistic effect. Um, there were lots of trials that were run that were not uh, done as feed additives. Uh, they were just directly applied to the water uh, where we were testing the effectivity in commercial setting. Um, and the combinations of uh, the protective uh, antimicrobial um, effect of the, the pediococcus in the gut of the animal mixed or blended with um, the carbon source that we're using that was not available to Vibrio, uh, including the spores from the, the bacillus, we, were wound up, we wound up uh, being able to maintain a very healthy environment at the same time protecting the animal, helping plate the tank with beneficial bacteria uh, versus pathogenic bacteria and because of the type of carbon source we were using, very much limit uh, the production of uh, Vibrio in the tank. Thank you. Uh, I'm back to Eamon. Did you, Eamon, did you detect any question probably that we didn't handle yet? Sorry, I've been mostly listening to <laughs> and, uh, follow, okay. following the discussion. So I was I'm not sure reading. I don't think so. Uh, ah, here there's a question on what uh, comparable studies have you done with barnacle nopli on replacing Artemia rotifers? Uh, we haven't, yeah, we haven't done anything on barnacle nopli. Uh, it's, uh, it's another company, another uh, copepod company, uh, Planktonic, are, are working uh, with that species. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, they have. Uh, been testing in uh, the Mediterranean market and in the, in the shrimp world as well uh, with uh, interesting results. Uh, as far as I understood, they don't need to enrich, which uh, yeah is music to my ears. And I think a lot of hat hatchery people as well. Uh, we like to say simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. And uh, yeah, in the, the concept of enrichment is not uh, something that you would normally find in, in nature. So if you have a, a feed that is already uh, encapsulated with all of the nutrients in their tissue and rather than in their guts, then it can only be a good thing and it will be certainly much more stable in the larval tank. Okay. The logistics is a little bit more complicated apparently with barnacle. Uh, it has to be transported still frozen even at minus 80. I, if I'm still I think I, I have to admit I'm, st I'm uh, still very interested in uh, for Jan, uh, for yourself to, to understand as well, the uh, the whole biosecurity aspect of transferring live viable nobly from for instance norway to other locations uh, and dealing with local register I, I know it was a question that was uh, raised a bit earlier as well how do you actually deal with that and ensure that for instance uh, uh, you don't introduce an invasive species into into a new area for instance yeah so um i i mean um especially with the, with the species we are, we are working on, uh, that's Acacia tonsa, uh, that is uh, basically uh, already spread clo close to all around the world. So um, and that's also one of the reasons uh, why we can, uh, can import to, uh, to a lot of different, uh, different uh, countries in the world. Of course, uh, there's uh, there's also uh, implementations of uh, using the co uh, copper pots with uh, with filters at the out outlet of your 
your, your tanks, but uh, that is also uh, very much dependent on uh, on yeah on what location you are uh, you you are working at. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So th you think there is no issue about the uh, transport of uh, well microbial communities from one place to the other place in the earth associated with uh, the transportation of copper pots? No, of course I'm not uh, not not saying that. So um, uh, from uh, especially from the microbiological uh, um, transportation, we are um, where, when harvesting our eggs, uh, we are desin uh, disinfecting uh, the eggs uh, where we uh, where we uh, briefly and we are uh, checking for. For for uh, a virus, so we can uh, completely say that we are uh, bacterial and virus free. So and that's why why I'm uh, confident to uh, to say yeah we can also uh, export to uh, to different uh, areas in the uh, in the world. Okay, uh, Joao, I guess I picked up another question in the Q and A on additives in relation to palatability. Uh, can you comment on that? What are the best additives in relation to other palatability for fish of micro diets? Well, it's, that's a very good question. Uh, when it comes to, uh, to the ingredients, of course, uh, there are a few ingredients we can use you know, to increase uh, palatability or try to increase palatability. We know that for certain species, uh, certain forms of grill uh, work very well. Um, different types of uh, fish meal, squid meal, etc. So we have a few raw materials that uh, we know that work well with certain species. Um, and, and to be honest, what we try to do is actually to understand, but this, this is not something that is just depending on one material. So we have a mix of materials which you need to test and, and then we can, we understand on feed uptake whether, you know, um, whether the and whether the larvae will will take more feed, less feed, we can analyze the stomachs as well. But I think there's no like there's no one answer for that. There's like a mix of ingredients we can try, and according to the results, we can select on the best ones and try to narrow down. But what's which is more what I think is most important is that some ingredients that work uh, best for attractability may not be the one the best ones for growth for example or for the health status of the larvae so again it needs to be a combined approach we need to analyze all aspects of fish performance and fish health to make sure that the larvae um, they get to the feed but they also grow and have a good performance okay probably a last question uh, that's probably still a hot topic a black soldier fly meal insect meal and how that has been used in uh, hatchery feeds can the panel comment on that eventually has this been tried yeah it's uh, uh scratching have uh, pioneered the use of this in uh, freshwater hatchery diets uh, certainly we have uh, launched it uh, in trout in france uh, together with uh, our uh, commercial partners as well there um, for marine larvae, it's a bit more problematic as the larva, the marine larvae require a higher digestible protein content and the black soldier uh, meal has a relatively high ash content and relatively lower protein content. So it's uh, price per unit protein inclusion is not so attractive for marine larvae. We need to have uh, protein sources that have uh, higher um, digestible content. Okay. But it's something that uh, we hope to see. Uh, the, the raw material itself is very new, and we hope to see uh, further development there on that raw material and look forward to it. Thank you very much, Iman. I think I more or less covered uh, most of the Q and uh, questions in the Q and A session. Uh, unless somebody can help me out with any, anything that I might have missed. Lucia, are we still in time for more questions? Or? Yes, I think I have one question for, yeah. for all the panelists. Okay, because we have uh, shrimp, uh, live feeds, and, and, and 
manufacturer trees. So beaverio is one of the main issues for hatcheries. So what can be done to overcome this from different speakers' perspectives? So for example, Neil, for the shrimp industry. Um, well, we are specifically from this testing, trying to, to uh, prove that we're able to control the vibrio uh, uh, propagation in a culture tank system by adding at a feed mill, um, a vacuum coated top coat of specific bacterial strains, probiotic strains, and that we can have the same outcome as the field multiplication, fermentation of probiotics trying to do the same thing and simplify the culture system, simplify the work, um, make it a more consistent, uh, uh, less, less costly uh, practice than what's currently being done. Our test was very preliminary. And this is the first one we tried in the hatchery uh, in a commercial setting where the client was risking his larvae basically on an experimental feed that had this vacuum coating uh, uh, applied uh, probiotic mixture. And we were able to, without any fermentation process or multiplication process, just the probiotics on the feed, vacuum coated onto the feed specifically in one country sent to another, applied to the tank, and we wound up with similar or better results than what the country was currently doing at the time. And we're going to continue to pursue that um, and try to uh, work it out to where uh, it's a very commercially viable, uh, available product that can be wound up being bought off the shelf. Okay. Okay, John? Yeah, I absolutely uh, agree with Neil and I there that um, that probiotics can can be one part of the solution. Um, uh, even also before mentioned that it's normally not only one um, one tool or one golden bullet to to solve these issues. I, I mean, uh, especially Vibrio is uh, is a problematic one. Uh, cleaning, uh, yeah, more intensive cleaning, keeping your larval cultures uh, as clean as possible uh, is another, another aspect. Um, yeah, and I mean, uh, rotifers are quite uh, known for causing some, uh, some uh, vibrio, vibrio problems and also with the copper pots, we are trying to do our part of, uh, of that, uh, that solution here. Okay, thank you. Eamon. Yeah. Yeah. Eamon, any oh, the, uh, questions uh, all along the production chain to keep the Vibrios at bay? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think um, Vibrio, first of all, are a natural part of the uh, biotope, so they are there, and uh, getting rid of them is maybe not uh, the, the solution, but the, the thing is to stop them from becoming uh, virulent. Um, if we look at the, the shrimp world, where we see that uh, a lot of questionable raw materials are being fed to the broodstock, uh, which start, in my opinion, uh, a large part of the cascade effect of uh, bringing uh, these pathogenic bacteria into the hatchery. That's a, that's a practice that uh, needs to be improved. And uh, the development of formulated diets, and that will have a key benefit for the industry. Um, other things like bio biosecurity and so on, and generally the quality of uh, the tanks, the quality of the feed, maintaining good uh, systems, generally you can get away with it, but you, you have to make sure, of course, that your water coming in is properly uh, filtered or disinfected and, and so on. You have, there are minimal um, husbandry practices that you have to adhere to. And I think probiotics are great. They're, they are fantastic, but they are not the, the single solution. They're not the band-aid. And we have to be very careful about how they are perceived by the industry. Um, they are a part of a solution to the, to the problem, but we have many, many different uh, things that have to be, holes that have to be plugged to really take the production uh, to the next level. If I can add to that, uh, since I'm uh, working on microbiology and aquaculture all the, <laughs> for about the last 15 years, 
So we have to keep in mind that Vibrio has something like a generation time between 15 and 30 minutes, up to 15 for a Vibrio parahemolyticus. That means that they are much faster, most of the time they're much faster than whatever probiotic you can uh, add to that. So that, and that means basically that I think from a scientific point of view, and I'm not with my boots into the practice every day, but we have to think about the fact that whatever activity we take, we supply carbon, we supply food into the tanks or into, into the ponds. And it is the amount of food, not per hour, not per day, per, per minute that goes into our uh, in our tanks that counts because that's what an Vibrio experience. The amount of food he sees per minute, per 15 minutes. And so we have to, and with culture on animals, we think in days. When we think about Vibrios, we have to think in minutes. And when we start doing that, probably we'll start understanding. <laughs> yeah, that's my okay. ad. Right Joao, do you have something to add? Yeah, well, I'll make mine the words of, uh, you know, pretty much all participants. Uh, but from my perspective, yeah, I think a key factor is really, you know, uh, what the people at the hatcheries can do in terms of cleanliness, you know, keeping the tanks clean as much as possible. And then from, you know, from the free production um, side of things, well, we need to make sure that, you know, we have the best possible diets. We need to make sure that the larvae in this case specifically, um, you know, especially the transition from live feeds to inert diets, they get most out of the, the, the feeds. And of course, there's also a possibility of, you know, enriching the feeds, just like uh, Eamon said, with uh, different components to help out the fish throughout these periods or more stressful periods sometimes. And this is the only thing we can do at this stage, you know, from a, from a feed producer perspective. I believe. Okay, so I think we can leave it here. I think it's been yep. two hours with the webinar. So if there's any unanswered questions, I'm sure the all our panelists uh, will answer by email. And thank you very much to all the panel for sharing your time today. Really great presentations. And thank you, Peter, for your great job moderating. And very thanks great. everyone for joining in. Yeah, thank you. And if you want to stay up to date on the latest news on aquaculture hatcheries, I encourage you to subscribe to our publications on our website, hatcheryfm.com. And see you next month for the, another webinar in the hatchery series on water conditioning and probiotics. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.